Okay, so announcements. First of all, uh, first big test, STEAM test, October 15th, a week from Thursday after we return from break. So you can spend your whole break studying STEAM. It'll be great. You'll have a wonderful time. Uh, so uh, STEAM test, October 15th, a week from Thursday, Spencer. Um, it'll be all on iLearn. Uh, I've got some questions on there. I, it'll, it'll, it'll take you the full time. It'll be, it'll be in lieu of class. It will be at class time and you will take it uh, on iLearn. So you can take it wherever you want to take it. So, I mean, we can't get everybody in here and... As far as um, secondary, like the ratings, is that the homework? Or the Everything we've done in the semester is fair game. Okay. Everything's fair game. Utility, utility rates are fair game, rate structures, demand calculation. Everything's fair game. Be sure and watch the video for the announcements. Uh, also another announcement, uh, also the 15th, <laughs> I don't know if you'll be interested in this, but uh, we're gonna have our first ASHRAE meeting of the year. We're a little bit slow. It, it will be, we'll Zoom it, and it'll also be in this classroom and this classroom. Um, fellow Mark Umbrag, and I never pronounce his name right, but anyway, is coming from Nashville. He's a TTU student. Uh, they will pay for your membership to join if they have not paid before. So if they've already paid once, then they don't pay a second year for you. But I suspect everybody usually graduates. I don't think any of you have joined before uh, and had the Nashville branch pay. That's like 20 bucks or something. Um, you'll have to submit an application. I mean, you could email it to me or you could come to the meeting. There'll be so, I think Subway sandwiches will be provided. Mark will give a little presentation. And uh, if we have time, we'll elect officers. I don't know if we'll get that done or not. Because, but you guys have a test <laughs> uh, at 12 o'clock that day. So, I mean, I don't know if you can come or not, but you can come for a little while um, and at least turn in an application. Grab a sandwich and, and leave if you had to. But uh, please spread the word. Uh, it's hard. Th these organizations are really suffering right now with all of this lockdown and everything trying to go video and all, I mean, it's just hard. It's hard to do this stuff. Okay, and I'll say it one more time, um, STEAM test and, and really utility rates, everything we've done up through STEAM uh, a week from Thursday, October 15th. On iLearn, it'll be someplace probably between 50 and 70 questions, uh, maybe more, I don't know, but so it'll, I mean, it, it'll be a significant test, and it, it is a major uh, component of your grade. So you need to take the STEAM test seriously. Um, I will also say that the following week, we'll have a quiz on the pump reading, you know, like we had a little reading quiz. We have a similar type document on pumps, but don't worry about that until we get past the STEAM test. So the the, the quiz on the pump reading, and I'll give, you, I'll give you a week or so to read that stuff before we have that quiz. So we'll talk about that uh, after we come back. But uh, we'll finish uh, STEAM today and start the uh, lectures on pumps. And I believe I did email you out the uh, pump information, at least some of it. Okay, so let's get moving. Okay, so steam traps. Uh, I'm also skipping, there's a couple of sections in the slides that you have that I'm skipping. There's one on, uh, I think, uh, space heating with steam and then steam sparging. So, I mean, I would love to, if we we're gonna spend most of the semester in steam, we go through all that in depth and detail. I think it's good information. Um, it will not be on the test. I will not test you on stuff that we don't at least discuss. Uh, in class. So, uh, so if you skip to just about the end of the presentation, uh, you'll find this, uh, these slides on steam traps. I do want to include those. Uh, they were mentioned uh, in some detail in that reading that you did uh, for our earlier quiz, but I want to go over this anyway. So 
you know, what steam traps a device to uh, use to pass or discharge condensate and non-condensable gases, that's an important part of its function from steam piping system with negligible loss of live steam. So the three important functions of steam trap are discharge condensate uh, as soon as it is formed, as quickly as possible, have negligible steam consumption, and have the capacity to discharge air and other non-condensable gases. Because all these steam systems get taken down from time to time. When they get taken down, they get full of what? Air. You know, it just leaks in. And perhaps there's some, you know, water or some condensate in there that kind of has built up and, you know, it's still in there. So uh, we got to be able to get that condensate out uh, upon startup and we have to be able to purge the system of air. So that's pretty important. Um, two, four, we got six different types of traps that uh, are mentioned there, and we will go through each one of those uh, in some degree of detail. Uh, you can find the steam trap manufacturers and vendors have all kinds of good information on the web. Spirex Sarco is a very, that's a company, and they have uh, tremendous resources. Uh, TLV uh, also is another steam trap company. They have very good uh, resor resources. That, that Spirex Sarco is S-P-I-R-E-X-S-A-R-C-O, kind of a strange name, Spirex Sarco and TLV. Those are, those are two good ones. And then Armstrong, I mean, there's a whole bunch of companies involved in this. It's, it's pretty big business. Okay, so here's what we mean by a thermostatic trap. There's a couple of different types of elements. This shows a bellows, and this bellows has some sort of a volatile fluid, like an alcohol or something, that boils at a set temperature. And so that temperature, when, when that, uh, whatever's coming into that trap reaches that high a temperature, that material, that fluid inside that trap boils. And when it boils, it expands, and that's a bellows, and so that's basically flexible, and it expands down, and the valve plugs the hole. So that's one way that you can close a thermostatic trap. So we've got a volatile fluid in here, and, it, and the fluids are selected based on what temperature you want this thing to close at. So, you know, if your live steam is, you know, 350 degrees, if this thing starts seeing 350, then you want that stuff to boil and shut off because you don't want it blowing that live steam through there. So if that thing, if it's shut off and that thing fills with condensate, then it's shut off and that condensate will start to cool down. And when it cools down, that volatile fluid will condense and the pressure will drop because it'll turn back into a liquid and then that bellows retracts and it opens the valve. So it just sits there opening and closing based on what temperature it sees. And of course, you know, you have to select the right fluid for the right steam pressure, you know, or you, 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 could, you could screw this up. <laughs> Don't forget, Murphy's always out there lurking in the woods and you can screw this up if you select the wrong fluid. It, usually you just give them a temperature at which you want to make sure it's shut and then the steam trap company will select the the, the appropriate fluid. Uh, we can get liquid and say, you know, w w when, when that stuff flows through there, uh, you can get uh, the liquid and you drop pressure on it, so you get some flash steam coming out there as well. That little bit of flash is just going to be condensed in the condensate system and it'll turn into liquid and flow on back. Uh, this is a bimetallic element. It's the same idea. You know, you just have two dissimilar metals. You know what a bimetal strip is or something. And so when you heat it up, you get it up to a high enough temperature, it retracts and it opens. And you cool it down, it expands and it closes. So you can do it with a volatile fluid and a bellows, or you can do it with a bimetal element. So other than that, the operation is the same. Uh, here is, uh, uh, it looks pretty complex. But basically what you have is um, you have an oil-filled element 
which expands when heated uh, to close the valve against the seal. So here you have an oil filled element and when this stuff gets hot, it expands. And if it gets hot enough, it, this little uh, valve closes and this little plug hits the seat and it shuts off the flow. So this would be engineered so that if you get live steam in here, it's hot enough for this to expand and close. So it's similar. Uh, there, this is actually pretty nice. It's adjustable. And so, you know, by, by adjusting the nut down here, you can move this thing back and forth. And so you can get it to close. If it doesn't have as far to expand, it'll close at a lower temperature. Or you can back it off and it'll close at a higher temperature. So they say typically between 60 and 100 C. Uh, but it all, and notice the last note, which makes it ideally suited as a device to get rid of large quantities of air and cold condensate on startup. So it depends, you know, how important that is to you. But if you have a system that's not going to be brought up and down very often, then okay, maybe that's not as important. But if you have one that comes up and down frequently, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to purge air out of this system. Uh, and you've got to get the air out, you know, so that uh, you just have steam flowing through your distribution system and your boiler and all that sort of thing. So um, that, that could be a prime consideration. Okay, uh, this is, I, I, I have put together uh, uh, information from different sources and so uh, some of this is a little redundant. But the, so this shows the thermostatic trap. You know, it's red because it has steam in here. And so this, the volatile fluid has boiled and this has expanded and we basically have plugged the, uh, the, the, the valve or the hole. And then when it cools down, it retracts. So it shows the same thing, more of the same. Uh, and then comments. So uh, opens to subcooled condensate. Depending on subcooling, can discharge condensate or condensate and flash steam. Because so if, if, if that thing opens pretty close to the saturation temperature, then when you drop pressure going through that little hole, then you'll get flash. You'll get some flash steam down in there. Um, allows energy recovery from condensate, significant air removal capability. So if you're stacking steam traps, this air removal capability is probably pretty high on your list of desirable characteristics. So that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, here's, it's called a float and thermostatic, uh, or an F and T trap. And so this has uh, really two different parts to it. So this is kind of like a, a toilet mechanism, you know, a little float kind of thing. Well, we put our uh, steam and condensate come in here together. The condensate, the liquid fills up, starts to fill up the tank. You got a float when you get up to a certain level that there's a valve that's tied to the float, the arm on the float. It pulls it up, it opens, and all of that, that liquid, that condensate will drain out uh, down here on the bottom. And then before, before, this thing gets completely empty, we close the valve again so that we don't allow any steam to pass out of that. So just that part by itself is not gonna pass any air. I mean, if this thing still has a condensate in it, when you shut down your system, that valve's gonna be shut. And so when you, you, know, when you start, start up again, you get air in this thing, it doesn't have any place to go. But you can put, uh, uh, a thermostatic element up here in this air vent. And so this can be like one of those little bellows that when it's cold, it contracts and it opens up the air vent. And so then when you start heating the system up, the air will flow through this thing and can escape the air vent. When it gets steam up here against it, it's hot enough, it closes it. So you, you kind of have two elements on, a, on an F and T trap. That's called an F and T trap, steam trap. So you got the air vent, that's thermostatic and you got the float that opens to let the condensate out. Uh, okay, so this, this shows the float trap just by itself. And of course, it's, you know, it's either 
Uh, there it's closed, there it's open draining condensate. And so if you had just a flow trap, uh, you, they don't get applied, it's always an F and T. Opens to saturated condensate, discharge condensate flash steam, poor or no air removal cap capability. But then we add the thermostatic element here and bingo. So when that's cold, it draws up and you let the air out. When it's hot, it expands down and keeps the steam in. Okay, so I think we've said pretty much all of that. So this has significant air removal capabilities on startup, discharge condensate flash steam. And there's even a little picture of one with a cutaway. So there's the thermostatic element and all that. Uh, inverted bucket. So here you got this bucket that's kind of upside down. It's got a little vent hole in it. So what happens, we put steam and condensate in here. Um, if this thing fills with steam, it'll float. Okay, and when it floats up, it shuts off. Again, it's like a it's just a, a different style of trap. So it's got a float mechanism that moves a valve up and down. When the, if this thing is all full of condensate, it will sink and it will open here and then that stuff can flow out. And because this thing can get full of steam, you know, to speed up the dynamic action of it, they put a little vent hole up here in the top of it and they let it vent. You know, if there's steam in here, it will... Uh, allow the steam bubbles to come out and they rise up in this section, which is really partitioned off, and then they'll condense up there and then the, the condensate will fall back down in the trap and get passed back to the system. So there's a little bitty loss, but that's really not enough to worry about. Okay, so that's the inverted bucket. Uh, that's just a, an open float type trap. Now the bucket is not turned upside down. So let's see, what are we doing? We're putting in steam and condensate in over here. Uh, the steam can flow up around this part of it. And so, and then we have a thermostatic air vent up here. Um, this thing will fill up and overflow. And when it so when it does, this thing sinks, and when it sinks, it opens the valve right here. And so hopefully we get just condensate and perhaps air. Well, we got an air vent here out of it as well. Uh, more on inverted bucket shows another cartoon, kind of like picture that's open. And then when it fills with steam, it rises and plugs the hole. And there's our characteristics. Opens to saturated condensate. We'll discharge uh, condensate and flash steam. Limited air removal capability. Uh, application in superheated steam servers should be questioned. Probably not good for superheated and intermittent operation, open and shut kind of deal. Okay, this is an interesting one. This is one that I, I don't know who invented this, but, but you do see them. Uh, these are very simple. They're not very expensive. And I've seen a lot of these in the field. And they do fail sometimes, but they just have this disc in there that claps up and down. You know, when it's down, it's shut. And then under the right uh, circumstances that we'll read about here, it pops open. It's called a disc trap. You stand there next to them, you can hear them clicking. Click, 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 as they open and shut. It's really, it's really quite fascinating. So uh, disc traps use the position of the flat disc to control uh, steam and condensate flow. When condensated air flows through the trap, the disc is raised. So condensated air, the disc goes up and we, we pass that stuff through, thereby causing the trap to open. Uh, as steam uh, heats up the trap uh, and the condensate above the disc will eventually flash into steam, the disc moves downward. So what happens is you get that thing all full of steam and the steam underneath the disc has a very easy flow path. 
So by Bernoulli, if you have a higher velocity, you have a lower pressure. The steam on the top of it has a low velocity, and so it has a higher pressure. And so that pressure difference is what snaps that dadgum thing shut. It's amazing to me that this, I mean, it's one thing to talk about this stuff, you know, in thermal lectures or fluids or whatever, but to see a device like that and to sit out there in the field and hear that thing clicking up and down, that's what it's doing. And, you know, it just proves that Bernoulli works. <laughs> but anyway, so the force that causes the disc to move down is generated by the difference in pressure between the low velocity steam above the disc, low velocity, high pressure, and high velocity steam that flows beneath the disc, so high velocity, low pressure. Discs normally fail open and have an uh, intermediate discharge configuration. So we got pictures, some more pictures of it. So that's in the open position. That's another picture of it. Flash vapor closes valve disc, bonnet chamber, all that stuff. So there you go, when it's, when it's flooded with vapor, it closes. Uh, opens to saturated condensate, will discharge condensate and flash steam intermittent. Can be equipped with a thermostatic element to improve air removal. So without the thermostatic element, it's not very good at air removal. Okay, orifice traps, we'll read this in a second, but let's look at it. So an orifice trap is just a leak on purpose, an engineered leak, kind of interesting. So this is one breakdown of them, where you see it's got an orifice plate in here. It's got an engineered hole, which is a hole dr drilled to a desired diameter. And you just put your flow in here and it continuously leaks. So it will pass, Condensate, it'll pass steam, it'll pass whatever's there. And hopefully you size the hole right so that you don't back a bunch of condensate liquid up into your system, but you don't want to size it too big or you'll wind up wasting steam through it. I don't know if this, this doesn't really seem like a good idea to me personally. I've seen some employ it in the field. I think over time those holes will well, they'll do two things. One, they'll plug if you have any particulates. And if it plugs, then you don't remove anything and you back up condensate until you cause a problem, a water hammer or flood a heat exchanger or something, something bad happens. Or the hole eventually corrodes and enlarges and then you pass too much. So anyway, but that, that's an orifice trap and they're out there. So advantages, uh, can be used for high pressure steam applications. Performance can be computed if condensate load uh, and inlet and outlet pressures are known. Continuous discharge, no moving parts, easy to maintain, cannot fail open, but erosion can gradually increase orifice diameter. Cheap, doesn't take much to take a piece of, piece of steel and drill a hole in it, you know? Heck, I can do that. That's probably the only one I could make. Uh, resistant to damage by water hammer and thermal shock. I mean, there's not much to break. Pressure drop across the orifice reduces potential for overpressure of downstream condensate system. Resistance freeze damage can be mounted in several positions. Disadvantages, usual failure mode uh, is closed due to plugging blockage by dirt or debris. Uh, screen or strainer may be required so you can try to clean up the flow before you put it in there, which would add cost to it. Uh, live steam losses, usually small when the orifice is properly sized, but wear and erosion can enlarge the orifice and cause excessive loss of live steam. Orifice opening cannot be adjusted to accommodate varying condensate loads. I mean, you just drill one hole and put it in, and that's what you got, like it or not. Uh, air can only be discharged very slowly, so it's not good at uh, allowing air out of the system. Engineering is required to select appropriate size orifice for a particular application. Ineffective if oversized or undersized, so you got to get the whole size right. Consequences of live steam in the return system must be evaluated. 
So that maybe if it's gonna cause you a big problem, maybe you don't wanna do it. Difficult to field check because of continuous discharge. Uh, does not function effectively when back pressure is excessively high. Yeah, so if something's going on in your, in your condensate system that raises that pressure higher than it should be, then you don't have any delta P. You got your same upstream pressure, but if you got elevated downstream pressure, then you can't push very much through there. So that's an issue. Uh, if the load is likely to vary by a factor of two or three, orifice plate may not be cost effective because water logging or flooding um, is possible or excessive steam may escape. So I don't know, seemed like a bad idea in general to me, but they're out there. They're simple and there's, I think we've, we've already been over all that. Okay, so that's, uh, those are the types of steam traps. There may be something else out there, but I've got six of them. That's pretty good. Okay, so steam trap investigation. So if you got there in the field, how do you find uh, a blown or a leaking steam trap? Well, so we can, we have visual investigation, acoustic, we can listen to them, thermal, and we can combine these uh, and uh, inline monitoring could also be used. So that's an infrared image of two steam traps. And they're both hooked to um, a live steam pipe. You see this pipe over here on the left, that's your steam pipe. It's white, it's hot, okay? So it's feeding into both of these traps. Well, this trap is hot, hot, hot all the way through. This is hot coming in, but cooler coming out. So now this is one point in time and you, you have to look at these more than at one point in time. But if both of these traps were closed, this guy is blowing live steam through it, it looks like. And it shows up, shows up like crazy on an infrared scan. Now, it's possible that at this instant, this trap had just opened and it was passing condensate and it's justifiable that that's hot on this side. So to tell, you have to stand there for more than, you have to look at it more, just one, more than just one time. You can stand there for five or 10 minutes because you know, most likely that trap does not have enough condensate that it's gonna just stay open all the time. So if it stays hot like that all the time, the suspicion would be that it's blowing live steam. This one may be working properly or this one could be plugged. It could be plugged and it can't pass anything, you know? So, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world to evaluate this, but this is a pretty good image to show what you can look for that would give you suspicion that something's going on here. My first suspicion would be that the one in the foreground had was failed open and was blowing live steam through it. Because say it's just as hot on the discharge side as it is over here. So anyway. Okay, uh, steam trap failures. Well, you know, I think it's pretty common sense, but how can they fail? Well, they can fail closed, in which case they don't pass anything and your liquid condensate backs up into the system. So we've mentioned that before. They can fail wide open, which means that they're just blowing steam. So the other thing you can do is you can look at your vent pipes on your condensate receiver systems. So say this is a vent pipe, there's a condensate receiver tank down there and we intend to vent the fly steam. So that's an atmospheric tank. So that, you know, that would be set up to vent, you know, what, 14.7 PSIA saturated steam. But when you see a vent pipe that looks like that, that doesn't look like flash. That looks like something has failed. So a steam trap could have failed open and that steam, that steam is being dumped into that condensate receiver tank and then it's going up the vent pipe. So if you're looking for steam trap failures, you go look at all of the condensate receiver tank vents. And you know, if you're at a facility, you might look at them once a week and you just say you got 10 of them. Then you just go out and you just walk around and go, eh, that's what that always looks like. 
That's what that always looks like. And you come to this one and you go, holy moly. Now, that's not supposed to look like that. You know, it's usually just kind of a lazy little, you know, bit of steam trickling out the vent pipe. And then you get this and you go, ah, uh, we got a problem here. Something's failed. Something's wide open from the high pressure system dumping steam directly into that tank and it's going up the vent pipe. So looking at the, the vent pipes uh, is one really, really good way to determine if you got some failed traps around. Uh, let's see, so anyway, larger failures, you know, should be addressed first. Okay, uh, a more visual investigation, limited applicability. Most of these systems are closed. You know, looking at those vent pipes is probably the most common thing that you can see. But I mean, sometimes like at a big refinery or something, they'll have, you know, they've got process vessels using steam and it's too far to take the condensate back to recover it. So they just run a pipe down and they just drain the stuff out on the ground. You know, right there, and you'll see, and where it comes out, when it drains out, you see a little bit of flash coming up out of it. And so, you know, there may be all of these uh, girders come down every 20 feet, and every one may have a condensate uh, vent pipe coming out of a trap going down to the drain, uh, going down to the, the ground. And so, you know, you see a little bit of steam here, you see a little bit of steam there, and you look way down there, you go, oh, and there's this big cloud of steam coming out of that when you go, eh, I think we need to go down there and take a look at that. And sure enough, if it's a vent pipe on a trap and it's blowing like 10 times more than the others, you go, eh, we got, we most likely have a trap failure up here. And you know, so if you can see it, it shows up pretty readily. It's just most of the time, all that's piped into a, a piping system and you can't see it until it gets back to the receiver tank. And if it's a long way back to the receiver tank, it may condense you know, in the, in the cool, cool pipes before it gets back there. And so, you know, if it's far enough, you may not see it. So uh, we do have to understand how the traps are supposed to operate. Uh, acoustic, we have listening devices uh, that you can um, uh, uh, go up to the trap, you got a little probe and you can actually touch it to the, to the trap and you can hear the sound of the trap in operation. And so if it's something like it's supposed to open and shut, that sort of thing, you can, you can hear the operation and you get used to listening to them. People get pretty good at diagnosing them. Um, ultrasonic uh, is used. Um, there's a device out there, Trapman, that TLV sells. And it's a system that's been developed over many years. That, and it, it has acoustic profiles for all of the different manufacturers' traps. They put a lot of work in this. And so when you go up to a device, it's a handheld device, you go up to this thing and you, you tell it exactly what trap that you're investigating and you put the acoustic leads on it and it gets a, a, a sound profile and it compares it to what it has stored away to see if they're fairly similar. And if it's like radically different, then it says it gives you a warning that this thing uh, may have failed and whether it's open or shut, that sort of thing. Uh, another, um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, m most people try to use more than one approach. You know, they'll, they'll look at it uh, on, on the infrared, they'll listen to it. Uh, and if there's a way to open a vent pipe and, so you can see what's coming out, that's, that's very useful as well. So combining those methods uh, is usually what's done. Uh, installation uh, trap, you know, you gotta get it uh, obviously installed properly. non condensable gas startup consideration must be targeted. Condensate collection system must be considered. Back pressure, lift. I mean, you may have a trap down here and you got to move that condensate up to your return line, which is 10 feet up in the air. So if you run that line up there, how much back pressure is that going to put on the trap? Because you're going to have a column of liquid 10 feet in the air. Well, one PSI is 2.3 feet for standard water, 2.31 feet. So, you know, you, you could put, be putting three, four, five, six pounds of back pressure on the trap 
based on the way that you pipe it up to get the liquid up to the return line. Something to think about. Uh, Two-phase flow considerations. Um, you know, if you have flash steam going in there, a lot of times the pipes are not big enough to accommodate, you know, some flash steam along with the liquid, and you have a hard time getting the stuff to flow because you have too much resistance to flow in the lines. Uh, let's see, condensate recovery investigation. Is condensate being recovered? Is the condensate recovered to the boilers with the greatest practical thermal energy? You see more condensate return systems that are not insulated. And you know, you may be condensing that steam at, at, at 100 pounds pressure, which means you're gonna get someplace in the range of 330 degree Fahrenheit condensate. You collect all that stuff, you get it back to the boiler house and it's 160 degrees. Where did all the heat go? Well, you know, it's lost from the lines and then if you put it in an atmospheric tank and allow it to flash, then you drop to 212 right there and threw away some steam. So all those things need to be considered when uh, condensate recovery uh, piping systems are designed. <clears throat> you know, can we recover flash? Uh, design, condensate, for, yeah. So, I mean, we want to get as much energy back as is practical to the system. Uh, maintenance, Inve you should investigate each trap at least once per year. Problem areas or our places at high pressure, probably twice a year or more frequently than once. Performance, testing equipment required and order of magnitude leak rate should be determined for failed traps. Orifice calculation set, you know, you can use your orifice calculations and the geometry of the trap to determine what you think the, uh, the loss rate is. Uh, under trap type selection should match the application. Universal mounts can be a good option so it's easy to change them out. Installation, establishing an investigation route condensate return, outsourcing. Uh, a lot of places just don't have the manpower and they, should, they can contract with somebody on the outside to do this for them. Uh, let's see, more maintain a database. Certainly we wanna prioritize repairs based on loss. The biggest loss is getting fixed first. Monitor, daily monitor receiver vents. That's those condensate receiver tanks that could be blowing live steam out of them and you have to train your folks. Uh, here's a little example of uh, where the wrong type of trap was installed. So we've got some uh, uh, steam heating ovens that just couldn't do the job they were designed for. And so the company was gonna replace them. They had a big problem. And this was gonna be like millions of dollars to replace these ovens, big deal. Well, somebody that knew something about steam traps started looking at this. So we've got um, 135 PSIG steam going to the ovens. At 135, the saturation temperature is 358. And you got a steam trap down there, an F, a thermostatic trap, that's set to open at 285. Hmm. So in other words, we're gonna start condensing steam in this oven that condensate's gonna run out, it's gonna hit that trap, and that trap's gonna stay closed until it sees a temperature of 285. Well, man, if we're cooking in that oven, it's condensing a lot of steam. So what was happening is we flooded the trap, we flooded half of the coils and the heat transfer surface in the furnace, and so the furnace couldn't heat. It only produced about half the desired heat. And so, you know, desired oven temperature is 310, and they couldn't come close to it. I said, oh, crap, this oven's no good. We're gonna have to replace these ovens. We can't make any maple syrup or <laughs> whatever it is they were trying to make, you know? And so somebody came in and looked at this and said, no, 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 hold on here a second. Let me change this steam trap pipe. So they put an F and T trap in there. Um, that opens immediately. You start draining condensate into that thing. When that trap fills up a little bit, that float opens and you get the condensate out of there 
and all of a sudden, all the condensate drains out of the coils and stuff in the oven, and oh, it works like a charm. So for a thousand bucks or something, depending on how many, I mean, you could replace those traps probably five, six, seven hundred dollars a trap, including labor. They avoided replacing all of their ovens. Wow. I bet that guy got a Christmas bonus, or he should have if he didn't. So that's an example of what can happen. Okay, just a few more slides here, and we're going to move to pumps. Uh, flash steam vent condenser. We talked about these in here, but that's kind of what a vent condenser is just a heat exchanger. A lot of times it's a shell and tube variety, and so if we've got flash steam or something that we can feed down in here in this shell and tube, we can put a fluid, I'm not sure which was the in and which is the out, but anyway, you should have it, probably this is the out because you're showing a temperature transmitter there. But anyway, so you put a cold fluid in here, it goes down and forth, back and forth in here a little bit, that flash steam condenses on the outside, we get condensate out of this, goes through a steam trap, goes into the condensate return system, and we get, we save that energy and we save the water that we were putting up to atmosphere. So that's a picture of a vent condenser. Um, so this is kind of the couple of slides here that show what it might look like installed. So this is uh, oftentimes um, where a, a tank that, that could be condensate, that could be a blowdown tank. That could be continuous blowdown coming out with, and just, you know, flash steam coming up that pipe and usually goes up 10 or 15 feet and just goes to atmosphere, okay? So, uh, you know, we got a pump moving the liquid through it, but uh, condensate or blowdown, whatever it is. So there you go. There's our vent condenser installed. And so that flash steam comes out of the top of that thing, hits that heat exchanger, spreads out in that heat exchanger, that cold fluids in those tubes, it condenses, the condensate falls back into the tank, and hopefully then you don't have any flash steam going up to atmosphere. So pretty simple device. And also, you know, if this thing is in a plant, maybe it's up north, it's cold all the time, you can run that flash steam um, through a coil and have a fan and just blow air across it. Condense it with air, get, get, you know, 120, 130 degree air, blow it out in your plant and do space heat with it. You can do that with it. So there's lots of possibilities for ways to use that stuff. Okay, woohoo! That is the end of the steam slides. So that's a major, that's a major accomplishment in this course. Because we cram more stuff down here in STEAM than probably we do in the other modules. But anyway, so that's the end of uh, my haranguing you on STEAM, unless I think of just anything, any, some small topic that I feel compelled to introduce. So we'll close that down. Now, let me just show you your, this is the document that you'll be reading from on your pumping for your pump reading quiz, but not until we have our steam test. So I think, yeah, I emailed this out the other day. Uh, I haven't looked to assign which particular uh, sections, uh, you know, one, two, um, probably one, two, and three. So it would, look to me and also the appendices the appendices are pretty good on this one so anyway um, i'll let you know which uh, sections i want you to read but uh, <coughs> i would spend my time right now uh, reviewing for the test but and this is i'll send it to you uh, these things are downloadable from uh, u.s department of energy they've got websites out there where they they compile this uh, efficiency information for industries to try to promote this sort of thing. Okay. Uh, 
I think this is the right presentation. Hey, that'll get us going. Yeah. Hang on, let me see if I can hit the right button. I've got bunches of different versions of this. Sometimes I get them confused from one to the next. Field monitoring pumping system. Um, this pumping system assessment tool is now in measure. So when you fire up your measure program, you know, it asks you, do you want to do a steam system assessment or a pumping assessment or a fan assessment, whatever. If you select pumps, then, you know, you have an equivalent program to this uh, uh, PSAT, P-S-A-T, which was the predecessor to the measure program. I've got both of them. I'll probably be demoing both of them for you uh, as we go forward. But, so, you know, okay, so everybody take a, take a big yawn and uh, clear your mind. We're no longer in the world of steam. We're in the world of pumps. In Portuguese, the word is bomba. So bomba is pump. So if I say bomba, I'm showing you my linguistic abilities that's about my only Portuguese word. <laughs> but I'm proud of it. And so I do use it from time to time. And it's fun to say bomba. You know, it's much fun, more enjoyable than saying pump. You know, that's almost kind of rude. But bomba really has a ring to it. So at any rate, uh, this is how energy kind of flows, you know, from the electric utility lines coming in. You know, I mean, there's a few pumps that are turned by steam turbines, but 99.7% of the pumps in the world are turned by electricity. So we probably concentrate on those. Um, so you got the utility feeder. That's probably high voltage, 161 kV or something. We got to transform it down to probably 460, 480 maybe a couple of transformers in there. Uh, we got the motor starters and breakers and stuff. Um, we could have an uh, adjustable speed drive, a VFD for speed control. You're starting to see more of them, but we may or, that, may, that box may or may not be there. And then we get electricity into the motor. Uh, there's some kind of a coupling from the motor to the pump. It could be direct coupling where the shafts are basically bolted together, or it uh, could be uh, through a belt and pulley system. There are some pumps that run on belts and pulleys. There's the pump itself. There is the piping system, the distribution, the fluid system. And there is the ultimate goal, which is why in the world did we buy, build, construct this, this pump and piping system in the first place? We had to have something in mind. Were we doing air conditioning? Were we doing heating? Were we, you know, running some industrial process? There had to be a reason, okay? Um, and it's oftentimes very instructive to look at that ultimate goal and say, well, okay, so I got this flow over here. I got to cool it down, or I got this piece of material that's coming out. So, you know, I got a certain rate coming off a line. I have to cool this stuff down. I'm going to do it with water. And so how much, how much water flow should I need to do that? So, well, I ought to be able to do that with 1,000 GPM. Well, then go put a flow meter on your pump that's actually doing that. Huh, I'm pumping 2,000 GPM. Well, why am I doing that? Well, heck, I don't know. That's just what, that's what the pump does. The contractor put it in, turned it on, and it pumps 2,000 GPM, and it works. It cools the metal. Yeah, well, yeah, but, you know, I could probably do it with 1,000, 1,200 GPM. I might get a little higher temperature on the water, but that's not going to hurt anything. Why are you pumping an extra 800 GPM? I don't know, because that's what it does, you know? You got to think about this, you know? What, what should it take to accomplish the goal that this system is there for, and then look at what am I providing at what cost, and do those things match and make sense? 
So that's why that ultimate goal box is out there. And I think all too often that is really not taken into consideration. Where you really see that is where a plant, um, <laughs> where a plant, don't, don't, don't let me run long again. I know I, I pounded y'all last time. Uh, where, where a plant has undergone a change in process. Maybe they've uh, taken out a product line, put in a different product line, reduced production on something. Maybe they used to need 2000 GPM and they took out half of their production capability. So now they only need a thousand, but did anybody bother to change the pump? Oh, heavens no, probably not. Well, that's working, don't worry about it, extra money. So at, at any rate, all of these different boxes potentially have inefficiencies. And you know, if you're gonna do a thorough job of looking at the energy flow, you need to think about, well, which of these can I do something about? A lot of them you probably can't do anything about. You know, like a transformer. There's probably not much you're gonna do for the transformer, but at least should be part of the thought process. Well, maybe. Call up an electrical engineer, say, I got this old transformer, you know, is it ever worth just replacing a transformer for efficiency gains? Probably not, but you know, it's, some, it's the thought process, being thorough and including everything in your system. Motor starter breaker, probably not. The motor itself, maybe. If that motor's 30 years old and in need of you know, a rewind pretty soon, maybe it would be better just to replace it with a high efficiency model. And then we might have to spend a little bit more, but that incremental investment might have a great rate of return. The coupling, you know, uh, something we see on belts. They make different types of belts. There's a standard V belt, there's a notched V belt, there's synchronous timing belts like Harley Davidson. You buy a Harley Davidson today, do you get a chain? When I was your age, I bought, if I bought a Harley, I got a drive chain on it. If I see a motorcycle these days, do they put chains on them anymore? Maybe a few, most of them are synchronous, no slip, cog belts. Well, those belts don't slip. And so a change in belt type could, could reduce your coupling loss. Something to think about. The pump itself, it may not be at properly sized for the service. The fluid system, we so we'll see lots of things in fluid systems that need to be changed. So anyway, this is, this is kind of the landscape where we're gonna be operating. Here's some comments on some of those devices, you know, some of this stuff we can't do much about. Pump system, ultimate goal, all that to be discussed. Motor, a little bit. Coupling, uh, losses are typically minor, but sometimes they can be managed, so we'll see as we go forward. Well, okay, if you go in a big plant, like a big paper mill, I, I was at a plant one time that had 3,000 pumping systems. I was there for a week. I mean, I'm pretty quick, but I don't think I can get to 3,000 pumping systems in one week. You know, I, I did a pumping thing at uh, Eastman Chemical up in uh, Kingsport. Anybody been to Kingsport and seen Eastman Chemical? It's not a plant, it's a city. They got buildings all over the place. How many pumps do you think Eastman Chemical has? I think they told me, but I don't remember, but way more than I could look at for like in three or four days. So what we did, we had a team of people from different aspects of the plant and they did a screening on which pumping systems we should look at based on their knowledge of the systems. And so you have to have some sort of a filter system to figure out when one is in and when one is out. And that's what this slide is. Um, you know, how to start with a whole bunch and then screen down to the highest priority systems that you want to look at, okay? At least initially. Now, if you work at this plant, you know, you know, every day, five days a week, you know, for years, then yeah, you probably have an opportunity to visit a lot maybe not all, but 
a lot of those systems to the point that you know you get most of the ones that need to be looked at okay but and and so this can apply not only to uh, this system to pumps but it could apply to fans and other things but so you start out there on the upper left and you say all plant motor systems okay so initially they're all on the table and you know, well filter one is well if they not used very much who cares how, if it's only used for three days a year who cares how inefficient it is it doesn't run enough to worry about so filter it out if it's really really small compared to everything else Maybe you don't want to worry about it, you know? So you put that in the policies and practices bin. You know, you say, hey, if you don't need it, turn it off. Go on, okay? So that leads us to big loads that run a lot. So then this filter, filter two, is non-centrifugal loads and adjustable speed control loads. Well, if they're already adjustable speed, the project's probably been done, you know? And so now you can go back and evaluate whether that adjustable speed capability is being properly utilized. We see that a lot and I'll make some comments about that later. Um, we, li we like centrifugal because we, if you can slow, if you can reduce flow or something on like centrifugal load, the energy use falls a lot. Non-centrifugal type loads, uh, not so much. So there's not the potential there to look at. So um, if it's non-centrifugal, already has adjustable speed, then it becomes either policies and practices or moderate priority. It's not on the highest priority list. So then what do we wind up with? big centrifugal loads that run a lot. And then we go into a box that says symptom or experience-based uh, segregation. So then we look for certain characteristics that we'll be talking about to figure out which one of those to give the highest priority and which one of those to give a more uh, moderate priority. So that's kind of how we can think about going through a screening system if we have a whole bunch of pump systems to look at. Um, I've got this, this present, I've got, <laughs> I've got one presentation that has those characteristics right here. Uh, this obviously isn't them. So let me talk a, a little bit about that and I will send out that presentation. I thought this was the one that I had found, but like I said, I have, probably 15 or 20 copies of this in different permutations. And so uh, I didn't get the one that I wanted here. Uh, these symptoms, one thing that we look at is where you come on the discharge of a pump and there is a valve. There's almost always a valve. There's often a flow control valve and that valve is pinched significantly, partially closed. And we'll see some pictures. It could be a butterfly valve with a handle on it. It could be some sort of a rotary valve, a ball valve, whatever. Uh, and all those valves have position indicators on them. You look at the position indicator and you go, this valve is halfway closed. So I've got a pump sitting here. All of the flow coming out of it goes immediately into a valve and the valve is 50% shut. Well, why is the valve 50% shut? Well, because if I open the valve, it pumps too much. So the pump's oversized. And so finding that pinch valve is an indicator that, hey, I can reduce energy use on this oversized pump. Now we'll go through all of this. Well, how can I do that? There's a couple of ways. I can reduce the speed. If I slow the pump down, it's like making the pump shrink. Well, if I leave the valve pump pinched and I slow the pump down, then I don't get enough flow. But if I open the valve, I get too much flow. And then if I slow the pump down, I can slow it down to the point that I get just the same flow that I need. And if I look at my motor power, 
it's gone down 15 or 20 or 30 percent. Well, crap, that was pretty easy. It's not hard. Now, doing the numbers is a little bit harder. That's one one. If you do that, you gotta buy the VFD. Let's say the VFD installed cost is 150 to $200 a horsepower. For round numbers, let's just say 200. So if I've got a 100 horse motor times $200 a horsepower, that's $20,000. Well, well, I gotta sell the boss on this $20,000 project. Well, and then you have to do the calculations to see what it's gonna, what the payback's gonna be. What's the return on investment? What's the internal rate of return? Whatever kind of number he wants to see. But another thought, say, well, just a second. You know, you get your, you ask everybody, does anybody ever adjust that valve? When was the last time you adjust that valve? Nobody ever touches that valve. Hmm. Nobody ever, never? No, I, nobody's touched that valve in five years. Maybe not then. I don't know when the last time anybody touched it. Well, shoot, I can take, stop the system, take the pump apart, and trim the impeller. I can make the impeller smaller in most cases. Now there's a minimum and a maximum for any given pump. Trimming an impeller, you can take it down to the machine shop in the plant. If you got a good machinist, he can trim it. Take this thing, put it on a lathe, I want you to cut a half inch off this impeller. Put it back in the same pump, the pump's smaller. Turn the thing on, measure the flow, you know, you get to open the valve some, whether you get to open it all the way like you'd like to, depends on what a good job you did on telling them how much to trim off. What you don't want to do is tell him to trim off one inch when he needs to trim off a half an inch. Because <laughs> then when you turn it on, you don't get enough flow, and then you got to buy another impeller. <laughs> so you can shoot yourself in the foot. But if that flow is not needed to be adjustable, you can just trim an impeller. So, you know, and there's other characteristics we'll go through later, but, you know, you can, you can do, if you know what you're looking for, and for different, there's different configurations, there's more than one, just one thing, but that throttled valve is very, very common. And so if you can find a bunch of those, and, and you know, if you look at, you can look at 10 or 20 systems in a day for sure, you might find five, six, seven, eight, nine. You might find all of them throttled. Or it's possible you might not find any of them throttled, but most of the time you will. And then that gives you a leg up on identifying a uh, project. Okay. Uh, just some general fluid information. Um, fluid movement energy requirements are proportional to uh, mass and head, and head is pressure difference. So for example, uh, if you were to raise 10 gallons of water, which is approximately 83.3 pounds, carry it up steps, then the elevation change is 120 feet. And we call that static because it's a change in potential energy. So that is, if you multiply that together, that was, that's 10,000 foot pounds, right? Foot pound force or 3.24 calories. And the depressing part is that's less than one M&M. &M. So if you're, if you're on a diet, <laughs> for every M&M &M that you don't eat, it's equivalent to carrying that 10 pounds up, uh, raising its elevation 120 feet which is how many, what is that, 100, 130 steps? Oh man, that's painful just to think about. <laughs> yep. You multiply, I, I didn't bring my calculator, but if you multiply 83.3 times 120, I bet you get pretty darn close to 10,000. Lori's checking me. <laughs> pretty close? There you go. All right. Now, so that's energy required. Power is, well, how fast did you do it? 
How fast did you climb that, those 130 steps to get you 120 feet? Let's say you did it in 180 seconds. I don't think I could do it that fast, but you guys could probably, you, you guys could probably just run up those steps. So if you divide that out, that becomes a tenth of a horsepower or 65 calories per hour. So we're talking about energy and we're talking about power here. Okay, fundamental relationships. <clears throat> uh, I like this, it's simple. It's pretty easy to remember. So fluid power, so a given flow rate in GPM times a different, a, a given pressure increase expressed in feet of head. It could be an increase or a decrease, whether you're adding energy to the flow or taking energy out of the flow, times the specific gravity of the fluid divided by 3960 is equal to the fluid horsepower. Now, what is specific gravity? I find that the average senior in mechanical engineering has forgotten what specific gravity is. is. You've heard the term, but you don't really remember what it is. And until you do this, a lot of this pumping stuff, you probably won't. But in flows and pumping and piping, you use it all the time. So what kind of a number would you expect to see for specific gravity? Anybody? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There you go. There's a man on his specific gravity. That's right. It's the density of what you're pumping divided by the density of standard water. But, you know, so that number's typically gonna be around one. You know, if it's, if it's hot water, the specific gravity of 250 degree water is less than one because as it gets hotter, it's less dense. But it's not gonna be 200. It's not gonna be 100. It's not gonna be 15. It's going to be a number like 0 0.85, 0 0.89, 0 0.9, you know. Uh, the specific gravity of motor oil, because you know oil floats on water, it's going to be 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 0 0.7. I mean, I don't know, it depends on what kind of oil it is, okay? But that's a number between probably 0 0.6 and 1.2 or 1.3. I mean, what's mercury? Mercury is probably, I don't know, two or three, and the mercury is heavy compared to water. But that's what it is, okay? And so you gotta, you gotta make sure you understand what specific gravity is. So let's say I go through a valve and I drop 20 feet of head in pressure across a valve. Well, how much energy did I take out of the flow based on that pressure drop? Well, this is how you, this is how you can calculate, okay? So if, if you look at, you wanna reduce energy well, so energy is what? Power over time. So, I mean, how can I make this number smaller? Well, I can, I can reduce the run time. Instead of running it all day, I can turn it off for four hours a day. That'll reduce the energy. I can reduce the flow rate. Maybe I only need 1200 GPM instead of a 2000. Or I can reduce the head. I can take the pressure drop away, reduce the pressure drop across the valve, and then that should reduce my operating cost. So, I mean, I don't really have all that much to work with here if I want to reduce the operating cost. Okay, so, you know, just looking at energy flows and all that sort of thing. So, if you're looking across a pump, you start over here on the right, we've got some flow rate in, some mass flow, in, uh, so GPM in, GPM out. And so we got a, a, a lower pressure in, a higher pressure out. And so, you know, there's some increase. I'm calling this water horsepower or fluid horsepower, whatever. So I have some increase in energy content of the fluid 
itself as it goes through the pump. And then I have a shaft that's turning the pump. Well, the efficiency of the pump is, well, it's the water horsepower divided by what we call the brake horsepower that's coming in in the shaft. Makes sense. Energy out divided by energy in. Sounds like efficiency to me. And so here, this is, um, well, here, here we go, down here. So, you know, there's fluid energy increase. If I divide by the brake horsepower, then I get that ratio is equal to the efficiency of the pump. Well, I kind of got the same thing going on with the motor, and this shows direct coupling between the motor and the pump, so there's no belts or anything in here. It's like the same shaft. But, so I've got the, the power, the energy coming out of the motor is equal to the energy going into the pump, but this motor has losses, right? So I've got, I've got uh, input power, it's electrical, but it, you know, I can put it in whatever units I want it in. I typically think about it in KW, but if I put them in the same units, then the efficiency of the motor is the power in, that's going out of the motor in the shaft divided by the power that's coming in in the electricity. Makes sense. And so that's this one. <clears throat> so motor input power times motor efficiency is motor shaft power, which we typically call brake horsepower. Okay? And you can juggle this any way you want to. And notice that one horsepower is 0.746 kW. So I can express it in horsepower, I can express it in kW, you know, whichever units you happen to like. And just to extend it one step further, if I stick a VFD on it, guess what? This VFD has losses as well. So now we've got input power going into the VFD. The VFD loses two, three, four percent at least. And then it has electrical energy coming out going into the motor and the motor has its losses. It puts out brake horsepower, which becomes the brake horsepower going into the pump. The pump has its losses and we wind up with some of this energy actually appearing in the fluid. And so you see the relationship between VFD input power and the fluid, the, the energy that actually showed up in the fluid is that energy divided by the product of the efficiency of the drive, the efficiency of the motor, and the efficiency of the pump, all in, in a fra in fractional form. So, you know, this could be 96%, this could be 92%, and this could be 70%. And so you multiply, you know, 0.96 by 0.92 by 0.7, and you take that and divide it into this, and that shows you, you know, the relationship, what you get here versus what you put in over here, okay? Uh, I think that's a, that's a pretty good place to uh, stop. So let's go ahead and uh, call it quits for today. And uh, I would be studying the STEAM stuff, and I will uh, probably email you out a slightly different presentation here. But anyway, we'll continue with the pump discussion. Yes, sir. Can you go back a couple slides where we were doing the down? Yeah, just a second. I'm on it. Thank you.